Hello and welcome to LSB Film Productions. Today I am interviewing Mark Byford, who is a keen and passionate grower and supplier of fresh fruit and vegetables. He has also set up a company known as the Community Interest Foundation, and we will be talking a lot about his journey so far. So welcome, Mark. How are you? Oh, yeah, we're all right. Living the dream here. Absolutely. So please tell me about your business and your aims of what's going on. Yeah, we've, Chris, I think we're both quite realistic to what we believe is going on around the world. And um, one of the things which I've kind of been looking at in all of this is the, the what do we do about it? But to get to the what do we do, we need to understand where we've come from yeah, and yeah. how we've got to where we are. And I think if people took on board probably 5% of what we have a fair idea of what's going on, then there would be um, a very different outcome. Um, you know, we've, we've got governments worldwide which have, have got forest fires going on, floods going on. Um, and if you can imagine there's a funnel and at the bottom of this funnel is the food supply, but the funnel's black. So you can never actually see how much food's in the funnel. Um, and what I think we kind of got to that point, kind of that tipping point where the funnel is now in the neck and it's almost out. You know, I would say probably within the next 12 months, we're going to see some horrendous food shortages. Um, so when you look at that as a forward thinking person and from my side as a, as a farmer, um, and understanding, you know, I work for a fruit and veg wholesale company, as you know, um, you're looking at that then and going, crikey, there's going to be some big changes coming, Chris. And, you know, and so I kind of think the farming world, um, has got to adapt to what's coming because we've obviously had the, the ban on nitrogens, phosphates, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but they do probably produce about 60% of the food we generate around the world as a result of those two things. So if you take that away and you add in the floods, the droughts, the fires and everything else, and you can gradually see all of this slipping away. Um, so the company I'm working for, for the fruit side, um, we've looked at that and gone, okay, there's some huge changes coming because I think for us to get to (laughs) net zero, um, we're not going to be eating avocados from 5,000 miles away. No, absolutely. And and if we are eating avocados from 5,000 miles away, we're going to be paying the tax on getting them here without a doubt. Undoubtedly so, so, yeah. You know, so I think as, as a result of that, what we're going to see is a lot more farmers um, and growers needing to produce a lot more stuff locally, which I yeah. think will flip us back to seasonal food eating, which I, which don't I think, think is a good thing. I was just going to say Absolutely. the same thing, Chris, to be honest. Um, so I think we're going to see that. We are going to see a lot of people who haven't yet looked into this in a year's time going where's the food going to come from you know if you take a look at holland at the moment and you know you've got holland producing more food than they ever could eat and it's surplus for europe and it's shipped all around the world um but the world economic forum are quite happily just destroying every farm in holland and saying we don't need you to grow food well you know, you can only keep going for so long with no food being grown and suddenly the um the funnel dries up. Exactly. Um, You've also got to bear in mind the fact that the government are hell-bent on trying to um, get farmers to sell their farms. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's a UK initiative at the moment where, you know, if, you've, if you're a farmer and you want to retire, um, you can probably get about 10 times the value for your farm if you retire and, um, and shut it down. And, you know, why not? Let's rewild everything chris it's a great idea you know we've, which um, basically just means keeping us people out of the countryside really well i i don't think people have actually realized that yet i think that people think no it's just gonna all be pretty flowers and lovely trees everywhere 
No. No. Um, if you understand, uh, you know, I know, you know, we first met through you um, doing the video about the 15-minute um, cities and, you know, 20-minute zones in Thetford. Um, and as a result of that, when you start looking into the nitty-gritty of that, it literally means you won't go to the countryside. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, they want us confined. <laughs> yeah, they just want us mere mortals confined in our little districts, our little areas, yeah. and let them have the run. But they seem to forget they need to eat too. They do. Now, the world's a big place, Chris. It is. Um, and I would probably say that somewhere around the world at this point in time, the elites have got a lovely big piece of land. Um, with ample amount of farming space to grow what food and you know to rear what animals they require um, to keep themselves afloat. So I can only assume that must be the case because that must be why know, Bill Gates is buying up all the US farmland. I actually don't think it's that. I'll tell you why I think he's buying it up. Because if Go you want to starve, if you if you want to starve the population, Chris, then just buy all the land and don't grow anything. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, that's another. So, of looking at it <laughs> and i think that we've seen in the past you know few years you know since the pandemic i think it's pretty well played out that some of the big landowners have got very big and you know they're quite happy to get paid you know um, 25 times more than it's worth to farm the land to set trees and you know pretty flowers and it's not going to make any difference to their life they'll just be better off as a result of it no, absolutely. I totally agree. And uh, just the whole fact that they're demonising carbon, which is the gas of life, basically, isn't it? <laughs> when, when you have, when you grow, um, well, you know, as a, as a grower, when you have, you want big tomatoes and that, don't you pump the carbon chemical into it? To you pump carbon dioxide them? into the greenhouses, yeah. And that's exactly. how you get the fruit. You know, if you look back through history, um, there was plenty of times where we had 100 times more carbon dioxide on the planet than we have now. Absolutely. And as a, resu as a result of that, we had bigger trees, bigger plants, bigger... Bigger know, people. <laughs> bigger people. The, the, the grass grew more. Everything was bigger. Um, and if you keep shrinking it down, where do we end up? And I think hungry. <laughs> I think very and, hungry. And dead. And I, and, and, and I kind of think that's, you know... I think we've all agreed that over the last few months that, you know, they're going to do whatever they're going to do. Uh, as a result of that, what we need to do is to come up with solutions. Absolutely. And that's kind of where, you know, we've, as you know, we've been in the process of setting up a CIC, a community interest company. And with that, we're looking at projects we can run on a local level for local yeah. people. And that could involve growing of food for instance if i use that as one example because i think that what we're going to see as i said earlier with the the change in where the food's going to come from local growers are going to need to step up to fill that void and they're going to have to step up fairly quick 100%. I, I think we've inside the next 12 to 18 months if we haven't stepped up massively the west as a whole is going to go very hungry because we're used to rape and pillage around the world and we bring back everything we want. And isn't it great in England? Um, well, that's lovely. But the rest of the world, through the BRICS nations and different things, are waking up to all of that. And we're now entering a very different time for the West as a whole. Um, so I think that with the farmers changing their plan, and I think there's going to be a lot less cereal grown, and I think there'll be a lot more vegetables grown, which I think is you know very key to this, and that we're going to see, because of what's happened with the likes of Bill Gates, for instance, and the manipulation of seeds, the manipulation of um, fertilisers. Well, if you can't use a fertiliser, then you need to use a manure. Oh, we can't because we're getting rid of all the animals because they fart too much. Um, That's right. Is, so isn't the island uh, tr they want to cull 200,000 cows? 200,000 beef. Yeah, well, why not? You know, they, um, you know... <laughs> It's just pathetic. Insanity, isn't it? it? It is. So I think what we might see develop, and, and I think this is the way forward, the company I'm working for at present, um, Just Bit Produce, they've quite visionary directors, I have to say. So they've given me the quest on bringing on board 100 farmers, all within 100 miles, 
that can grow what we need to sustain building the business moving forward. Yeah. And one of the things which I've seen going out to see a lot of growers that a lot of the farms have missed a generation. So granddad had the farm. My generation didn't do the farm. They went off and got jobs in cities and things like that. And then the grandchildren are now going, well, I quite fancy running the farm. So the younger mm -hmm. generation have no preconceived ideas either of how the farm should be run. So they're right, coming yeah. in, they're coming in Christmas from a background of what well, I'd like to do it without as many chemicals. Well, you know, you can love or loathe chemicals. There is a place for them in the farming community because there's certain things you can't do without them. However, I do believe there is also a massive amount we can do on the border of the two. So yeah. you know, it might not be that it's a hundred percent organic. It might not be that it's chemical based, but there might be somewhere in the middle where we can draw a common ground. A, a, a fair I, balance. Yeah. Yeah. That's and I true. think that yeah. the younger growers accept the, the requirement for organic where their grandparents went, ah, just chuck some more fertilizer on. Um, so they're going to see it from a, a different light. They obviously want to see it from a, um, a profitability point of view as well, where granddad may have grown grain to earn, 50 pounds you know an acre they can look at a field full of lettuce and go well that earns me 500 pound an acre yeah so but it's more time consuming and you know this will come on to one of the other things i'll talk about with the growing food at home is it isn't easy to grow food but it no, isn't I impossible. <laughs> <laughs> but what i will say it isn't impossible chris you no, know no it's not the human just race education yeah, absolutely. And the human race has managed for tens of thousands of years to feed itself. It didn't rely on governments and it didn't rely on, you know, the Tesco. World Economic Forum, Tesco's, Tesco, oh, don't get me started on Tesco. <laughs> um, so I think what's going to happen is as we move forward, and you talk about Tesco's, Chris, and this is one of, and, not, and I don't want to bash Tesco's here because they've been really supportive um, of, of our farm, you know, and, uh, uh, in the well, past. But what I will say for the supermarkets as a whole, the public have allowed them to have that hold. So yeah. they didn't get it all on their own. The public allowed them to do it. And I think if people were honest with themselves and said, okay, if they understood, because I think one of the problems is we've become very um, removed from any idea of what food is anymore. Um, oh, yeah, they think beef was born on the shelf and you just go and take it. <laughs> We um we have children come to the farm and you know and I always remember one day I was walking around the farm with a group of kids and and one of the teachers said to me oh what's that and I said well that's wheat and she said and what do you do with wheat I said you make bread and she said oh and she was really surprised and then we went a little <laughs> bit further and she said and I, she said so what's this one with the little spiky bits on I said oh it's barley and she said wow she said so that's a different type of grain I said yeah she said, well, what do you make with grain with barley I said beer <laughs> and and she was like, wow. <laughs> And, and I mean, God, and you're it's, it's our slightly children. concerning that these people are educating our children. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I think there needs to be more knowledge. There needs to be a lot more knowledge um, in where food comes from and That's in how it, it's yeah. produced. So, I think we need to see a lot less of the um, packet food yeah. moving forward. I think we need to see a lot more of. Um, home deliveries and this is one thing which i think you know which our company is certainly looking into is the home delivery side of boxes of fresh fruit and vegetables and we've noticed that trends are changing really quick really quick i've noticed that if i put a post on facebook now with a field of lettuces for instance um that i'll get four or five people will say oh do you do home deliveries well you know, two years ago, you'd have advertised for a month to get someone to ask that question. So I think there is a change coming. And yeah, I, I think it's turning, definitely. Yeah, and I think what's going to happen, if people start getting solutions offered to them, then they will take up those offers. So what I would like to see is a lot more people growing food. That's where my passion lies. You know, I come from a farming background. Um, you know, as a small child starting school we always had a, a garden to tend you know I, I grew up with a granddad who had a huge garden free allotments you know and at five years old my job was to you know hang on to the rotavator for dear life even if it was going through the hedge with me attached to it um <laughs> i didn't have enough sense to let go <laughs> yeah. 
So I think that we're starting to see that people want this fresh produce side again. And I think as a result of that, there is a number of things what people can do to achieve that. So whether that's, you know, looking at going to farmers markets, um, small village stores, for instance, where, you know, as a company, we supply a number of village stores um, and their sales are going, you know, up and up and up each month as a direct result of us selling, for instance, silly things like bunches of carrots, bunches of beetroot, things what look like they come from a farm instead yeah. of it being wrapped in plastic, for instance. Um, That's it. Like you'd like you'd see it in the traditional farmers markets. Yeah. Which so we need we're more starting of. to see that, that that move back towards looking for that. And we're also seeing, you know, that can see that people are moving back towards the markets to get their fruit and veg, whether that's a farmer's market or a provision market, like we have in, obviously in Berries and Evans, we have a, still a, a fairly good market. Um, so I think that things are moving, things are changing in the food industry as a whole, um, but we've got a lot further to go. And what I would say to anybody who's thinking about, you know, oh, I've got a garden at home, don't think about it for too long. It isn't overly complicated to grow stuff. Get your, you know, get your garden dug, get some compost into it, get some seeds, and you've still got plenty of time this year to grow a lot of stuff. When you break down, when I got into prepping, Chris, um, sort of just prior to the pandemic, I had started looking at just how much food you would need around you to feed yourselves. Yeah. And it actually gets quite scary if you dig into it. Because if you think you want two or three meals a day, let's say three meals a day, that's a 1,000 meals a year per person in your house. Mm -hmm. So if you go, well, I've got 20 tins of beans put away, well, that's great. What are you going to do in three days' time? So if people start to be fearful of the situation, I don't think that's the way forward. I think the way forward is to come up with the solutions. And I do think a big part of this is how much food can you produce yourself? How much food can you produce in your local community? Most villages have allotments and there's always one of the allotments is sitting empty. Now, that's a great community project, I have to say. So the I community think definitely together, community, is, like you say, community has definitely got to be yeah. one of the leading drivers in ensuring that there's enough um produce to feed the community i think yeah. like you say it's incredibly difficult to literally be self-sufficient especially if you've got like a family of three or four yeah. you, you need to have that community around you in order to achieve those targets and it's also a great yeah. way of bringing the community together so yeah definitely definitely yeah i think that we're gonna see a lot of changes um and the biggest changes I think we're going to see are on a local basis. Because if you go back to when, certainly when I was a kid, you know, the, um, the village had its village fate. Everybody from the village came. Everybody knew everybody in the village. And you knew if mum wasn't there and you misbehaved, it'd certainly get back to her. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I remember and those I think, days. Yeah, and I think that's where we're going backwards to, you know, Whilst the 15-minute cities like you, they terrify me. They really do with what they want to do. There is some aspects of it where you can actually go, well, actually, that makes sense. What doesn't make sense is how they want to implement it and how they want to force it upon us, and that's what I what worries me. That's right. I mean, everybody wants local amenities where things are easy, ac easily accessible. Sure. They also want the choice to be able to go to the next town to yeah. get something that this town might not have you know yeah, it's I mean, about the forcing of which is the issue really yeah i mean if you look at let's say food for instance and we we look at i don't know let's say olive oil um i've got a friend who has an olive oil or a, an olive farm out in italy and they produce up until the pandemic they produced tens of thousands of liters every year literally hundreds of thousands of liters of olive oil then the pandemic came, there was not the ability to move the staff around the planet. So they cut back on production and they only then had the locals come in and um, pick just to, to supply the village and so forth. 
And that happened again the second year. Well, what she's now found is that the situation is that it's more profitable for her to actually have it at one hundredth of the size it was originally. Yeah. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot of. So we're going to see a lot of things dry up. Let's say Italian olive oil, it might be, you know, whatever, pasta, whatever it looks like. But I think what will happen as a result of that, over the course of a few years, we'll get other farmers that will step in to that. I'll, I'll give you a classic example. I was driving out yesterday to do a delivery and I came across the new vineyard was just been put in. And I thought, wow, that, I hadn't noticed that before. So, and it's a good, you know, probably 20, 30 acre vineyard. So someone has had the vision to think to themselves, if all this is coming into play and weather is potentially getting warmer in the UK, then maybe we should capitalise on that. And I think that we're going to see that a lot, lot more. There will be, I'm sure there will be voids. You know, we can't grow bananas in the UK and we certainly ain't going to grow avocados. Um, but then I do on the other side of that think to myself, you know, from the green grocer head here, do we really need to be in, importing spinach from the likes of Spain when it is something we can grow in a polytunnel in Bury St. Edmunds? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And I've know, noticed there's a huge, there's a huge greenhouse, I assume it is, on the way into Bury St. Edmunds. There is, yeah, that's run by the bomb group. Um, the peppers from there, we've tried and tried and tried um but cannot get through the door because they're all owned by supermarkets and just that one plant grows three percent of all the uk's peppers but they're all sent to a distribution center in uh, in london where they're put on a trunk has come all the way back to Bury St. Evans tesco's to be sold locally <laughs> that's ridiculous where's the freshness in that <laughs> um but they won't let us buy them so you know uh, you know i think this they're, they're the changes what have got to come chris you know, yeah, it's, it's gonna at some point. I do see there will be growers like that that will allow small um, buyers like ourselves to go in there to supply the local community. And I mean, we've been quite fortunate as a company. We've been developing some really good uh, bonds with local growers, and as a result of that, from you know Lower Stoff to Felixstowe to across the Cambridgeshire, we've got a bank of growers now that's developing. And you can already see that how they're changing their business models to fit in with what's going to come, um, which is encouraging from the point of there's going to be some food about, there's going to be some um, still some future plans in foot. Definitely. Need that. Providing, Definitely. providing, I will say, that the government doesn't change the law uh, to stop them achieving that. Are there any things that you can put in place to to bypass the law because a lot of what the government are doing let's face it is unlawful absolutely so there has to be a point where where you we need to bypass them and just completely I, ignore them i was watching richard vobes the other day and i know you know richard Shout out um, to richard vobes yeah a top man um I was watching one of his videos the other day and someone was saying you know really what we just need to do is kind of turn our back on the the system and i think whilst however broke the system is and we know it is um it's full of corruption it's full of borrowed money what didn't exist to start with and as a result of that you know we've ended up with everything about to fall around its ears whether that's a day a week a month two years time i don't know but it's obvious it's coming so as a result of that do you then look at it and go, okay, well, we've got this challenge here, let's say we could arguably call the government, um, or even above the government, the puppet masters, for instance, and it might be that they are in a position that they say, you're not going to grow food anymore. Okay, well, they still grow food. Yeah. And I think that what we're going to see, and this is where I see the community side, Chris, really coming into play. So on small allotments, and one one great thing I did watch on Richard Vobes was a guy which was a local farmer who'd given a field um, to a local group, and the villagers were growing the food on one of his yeah. fields. Um, so mm. kind of like a huge allotment. So kind of set up this sort of mini market uh, effectively to supply just people in the neighbouring villages. And I think there could be a lot more of that coming because farmers 
are not going to want to go hungry either, but they might not have the time to grow all of the food. There is going to be a lot more, I believe, people unemployed in the forthcoming years because of AI and changes and so forth. So as a result of that, then you can see that people will have a lot more time. And I, I was talking to my mum the other day and I said to her, I said, how did granddad always say, you know, he had massive gardens and free allotments and she said, yeah, but he didn't have a television hardly, did he? No, he, didn't have a he didn't have a phone in his pocket buzzing every 10 minutes. Didn't that's have the it. internet to worry about. So I think I'm, that. Go on, Chris. Sorry, I was just going to say. I know behind the scenes that there's a group of people with regards to like the labour shortages on farms, where yeah. like have you've heard of van life? Yeah. So you've got people travelling, wanting to earn money and wanting somewhere to stay, and they're kind of combining the idea of those people would go and earn a living, you know, working the yeah. farm which I think is a, a fantastic idea. That seems to be quite a popular thing. Providing they can travel more than 20 minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I think that providing people start now and start taking a bit more ownership instead of going, well, I'm just going to pop into Tesco's and buy some Brussels sprouts. Um, if they take a bit more ownership and start, you know, dig over part of the lawn and put it into a veg bed, you know, and get your heirloom seeds. You know, don't go and buy your F1 hybrid seeds because they just won't germinate next year when you come to taking your seed from that plant and come to grow it next year. Get some heirloom seeds. Start producing your own compost because that's really easy. You know, your tea bags, your eggshells, your garden waste, you, you know, get it all in the composter. Start putting some goodness into the ground. Start thinking about those thousand meals. You know, well, what are we going to do? You know, have we got room for a spare freezer? Have we got room for an extra shelf to put some extra tins of produce on? And, you know, in the summer when foraging's great, you know, um, when raspberries or might be blackberries, whatever it is in your area, mushrooms, anything at all, well, when you when there's an abundance of them about, get them. I'm no expert when it comes to um, making jams and chutneys and, you know, uh, but... We did prove this year it's possible. You know, my mum makes a lot of um, preserves. So I think that while the knowledge is still there, let's face it, the knowledge sits probably from my age and above of things yeah. like that, Chris, yeah. um, not my age down. And I think that one thing I would say to people, if you're thinking about getting into growing um, food, is to go and get some books on it. Don't rely on the internet because the internet might not be there the day you really need it. That's right. So go, go and get some really good books, study. You know, I know from my side, when I'm passionate about something, I'll put in thousands of hours of research into it to make sure that my knowledge on it is where it needs to be. Um, That's right. And visit and, the allotments as well and speak to people who are doing it yeah. already, you know, get advice from first-hand advice and see how they, how they do it. Yeah, I think that we undervalue the knowledge. What we might say, I'll give you a classic example here. Um, when I was at school, at primary school, we had a lovely veg bed. And the I won't name the other children because I don't want to be detrimental towards those, but the idiot in the school who couldn't read and write very well was particularly good at growing. Um, yeah. And, you know, so people would assume, oh, well, he's, he's just, you know, because he's, he plays with his hands and, you know, looks after animals because he doesn't have any knowledge to do anything else. No. <laughs> um, it's funny, actually, because I, I've, I've, I'm fast, I'm quickly coming to the realisation that the more academic you are as a person, the more down the rabbit, uh, not about the rabbit, the, the further in the matrix you are. Yeah, I think so you're right. It's those people who didn't do very well at school who didn't pay much attention at school, who yeah. are far more open-minded and yeah. the dreams. they're not as easy to um, convince of what's going on. Yeah, I think that the changes what are going to come are going to come from the grassroots side up. Absolutely. And they're not going to come from the government down, that's for sure. No. You know, what they're trying to push, I certainly don't agree to, and I didn't consent to it either, so won't be taking part. But for their side, as in the public here, 
they have the ability, as there's so many of us, you know, take this country where we've got 70 odd million people. Um, if 70 million people decided they weren't going to go to a supermarket in a year's time and they were going to spend the time that next 12 months to find out how to grow food, um, to go to their village store, to support local farmers market or the provisions market, whatever that might look like, a box scheme, anything else, then where would these supermarkets and the powers to be what supply them with produce? I don't know, let's say for arguments, Coca-Cola or Heinz, whatever it might be. Um, where would any of them companies be? Because exactly. if they can't take money, they can't continue. We all know that. Yeah. But it's our support of that system that has allowed it to flourish into something that we don't want anyway. <laughs> no, totally agree. Totally. I mean, there was that thing not that long back about the farmer saying, look, we haven't got an egg shortage. The the supermarkets yeah. just don't want to pay it. They don't want to pay the additional costs that it yeah. costs to make these, produce these eggs. And I so they've got us over by a barrel. So that's where I yeah. see the change yeah. where it's by direct. Yeah, I mean, where we live locally, there's a couple of young lads which set up a small dairy. Um, and with that dairy, they kitted out a horse box with a fridge and you just take your bottle put it in little chair dairies and um, you press the button and put in your pound or scan your card and it gives you the amount of milk what you need for, and it's real milk, real milk. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think to myself that initiatives like that, I think will pop up all over the place. Um, they need to. If they're allowed to, which is what I would say, if they're allowed to. Um, the one thing the human race is particularly good at is adapting. Yeah. That's why we've got to where we are at the end of the day. And all they're trying to do is to take out a level of knowledge. Um, the family unit, they don't like that at all. They, you know, because like I say, granddad taught me how to grow everything I know how to grow. We're losing a lot of that old time knowledge where yeah. we used to respect the old elders and we would get the wisdom from the elders. That's being bled out. That's being yeah. demolished. Yeah, and I think from my side, what I've certainly seen in the past um, three years, let's say, that uh, people's perception has changed of what they were led to believe um, yeah. in so many things, in so many things. Um, people that wouldn't have ever questioned anything in the past, for instance, uh, now are questioning things. And I think once people start to question a little bit, then you can quite quickly see they're going to realise things like the food supply chain is not only broken, it's been deliberately manipulated to reduce the amount of food there is available. Yeah. To have an outcome. On now, climate outcome, change. Oh, terrible thing. Um so as a result of that change, I think what we'll see is the positive grassroots changes in the community that will grow the food. You know, my granddad had a rhubarb patch the size of this living room. You know, it was huge. Um, everyone in the village had some. You know, it was, there was always enough rhubarb to go around. And Nan, when Granddad harvested, Nan cooked it, froze it down and put it in the freezer and it was there for the winter. And I yeah, think that we, we kind of lost a lot of that in the last 50 years. We've come, as I said earlier, we've come so departmentalised away from how food is grown. We, um, we were sold the lie of convenience when, in fact, really, it's not at no, all. It's no. just laziness. Which is sealing yes. our own fate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and this comes back to what I was saying about the television side. You know, Nan and Granddad, you know, they might have had it on to watch wrestling on a Saturday morning or, you know, the, the nine o'clock news. But the rest of the time they were busy doing things. Yeah, uh, whether it. that was gardening, cooking, baking, pr making preserves, you know, wh whatever it was, they kept themselves occupied. Um, and that did probably better for their relationship than most people have as well today because it's really easy to just sit and text you know and you're not really we've, we've definitely lost the art of conversation yeah we're not really present with the other people and i know i'm guilty of that you know my and heart's me. forever picking me up on it um so i think that, that 
the changes we you know you can look at the food chain and say oh this is these amazing amount of changes what we can make right from the growing in your back garden to having an allotment to a community-based csa schemes for instance to you know supporting your local farms which go to market whatever that might be but i think we both understand that in the past 50 years they've done a brilliant job of completely pulling everything what had had thousands of years to to progress pull it to bits yeah you know right you know if you look at the school system i mean the school system you know i've got an eight-year-old and um he's an intelligent intelligent little lad and he's already starting to question things which i love but same as my daughter she's very clued up (laughs) when you actually look at the well trash they're taught at school um and when you understand how many of those lies are within that trash um it's quite scary so you know where is the teaching kids how to grow some potatoes at school where is the teaching kids how to cook the potatoes at school where is anything what is going to be of any use to them when they leave school you know exactly they're too busy learning about genders When we were there, it was algebra, and we always went, why is that going to help us? Well, it didn't, you know. It didn't. Um, (laughs) And normal learning about genders. (laughs) Exactly. Well, listen, I'd love to get you back on maybe in a month or two and just see how things are progressing. Um, I'll I'll try and get you out on to to, um, other podcasts as well. Maybe Richard Hose might try and pick this up because he has more time than I do with regards to I'm, I'm, I'm not on the pro package for uh, Zoom, so I'm restricted <laughs> to time, which is really annoying. So I will have to upgrade at some point. But listen, it's been fantastic talking to you. Um, I'm yeah, sure the viewers are going to love it. Please do share the link out when it's up on my channel. Try and spread it as far and as wide as we can. And thank you very much. It's yeah. It's, it's nice my, to see that there's a change of foot and it's it's good to see that people are waking up to just how important the food chain is and what people can do to start making it better. So yeah. step up, get out in the garden, get your hands dirty, you know, go and buy some seeds, stick them in. The worst case scenario is you'll grow something. Exactly. And, you'll, exactly and you'll feed yourself and you'll know how good it tastes so that's the thing and enjoy it that's that's the key thing is enjoy doing it i look forward to getting you back on because we we do need to keep coming back to this and and getting the message out but for now viewers um thank you very much mark and we look forward to seeing you back look forward to it thanks chris cheers buddy Have thanks a great day.